Hello, friends. Welcome to the new edition of my second channel, The X Investors. Uh, I have a very dear friend and very knowledgeable guy in my show. He's from Serbia, a mining equity analyst at independentspeculator.com, founded by Louis James, a.k.a. Lobo Tigre. I would like to welcome Vukashin Pekovic. Buddy, thanks for coming to my show. It is great to have you. Hi, guys, and thank you a lot for having me. Thanks. Uh, I had a small intro about you, but you will give us a more broader picture of you, of yourself. Who are you? What are you doing in your life? Uh, where exactly are you coming from? Give us some some details, please. Oh, uh, I'm mostly just a guy, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, I, I have a I have a bachelor's degree in engineering, uh, electrical engineering to be precise. I'm 26. Uh, I'm based in Serbia. I'm mostly in Serbia all of the time. Um, and you know, during my, during my studies, I got interested in, um, in finance, uh, and, you know, to put the long story short, one, one thing led to another, one book led to another, and I picked up mining, uh, in 2021, I met my current boss, uh, Lobo Tigre, who, uh, needed some help. And, uh, I started, uh, I started working for him as an intern, uh, and then proceeded to, to become, um, uh, almost now a full-time analyst for the newsletter. Um, and we're one of, I'm not sure if we're the biggest, we're probably not the biggest newsletter in mining, but we're one of the biggest newsletters in mining. And our database currently has about 600 companies and, and some change. Uh, I cover about a third of that. So in a nutshell, that's my job. Uh, that's my background. I have an engineering background, no formal finance yet. Uh, I may get some. And uh, yeah, that's it. Great background, definitely. Uh, Kashin, how is life in Serbia at the moment? It's solid, much better than earlier. Uh, inflation has been kind of bad. Uh, I think we have the, the, the biggest inflation points in the... In no, the whole Croatia region. has the... Has or large. Croatia, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very tight race uh, yeah. in any case. But... Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, inflation, inflation since 2020, obviously, as is the case everywhere. But we've been one of the one of the, uh, you know, uh, let's say worst examples. Um, and uh, not to get into too much detail, but the reason is twofold: we get the euro inflation, and then we make it all worse by by with our domestic fiscal policy. Uh, okay. But despite that, despite that, um, it is objectively speaking much better than than say 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, I don't, I don't, I don't have the, let's say, the hands-on experience from 15 years ago since I'm 26. Uh, but uh, you know, I do, I was, and I am aware how how it was, you know. And usually, when when a country transitions from from has the let's say the shock therapy transition from from socialism or communism to to capitalism, you get a you get a period of pretty pretty severe deflation after that. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have higher unemployment. There's not a lot of money. <clears throat> running around the country uh while on the other hand you know today we have a pretty much the opposite situation um yeah. and the the you know the amount of money that flew into the country and that's still uh, flowing into the country uh, is is helping the economy a lot uh despite not having let's say you know the textbook uh economic uh, growth engines you know because i mean the government is most of the economy in serbia as is the case with most of uh of modern countries today but uh um in a nutshell you know it's much better than earlier because there's a lot of a lot of money um primarily oh. primarily through through real estate flowing yeah and and making the situation better yeah and the the unemployment uh, unemployment is really at, at record lows that's great to hear uh as we know serbia is relatively mineral rich country with lithium boron yeah. cobalt nickel coal some graphite uh, even precious metals uh, how is the current situation with the government? Are they supportive of exploration and mining? Are you seeing more and more companies coming in the search for minerals? Uh, I'm not sure about the influx of companies uh, because there are about, I know about five or six players, you know, currently in the country. Uh, one one big player that left the country. So let's start with the, say, you know, kind of bad stuff. Uh, there are two bad things. Uh, after, after <clears throat> uh, yeah, during COVID actually, uh, first quantum left the country uh, and that wasn't a big hit to our to our yeah. mining in any case but there there were some let's say outflows of players um and the 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 second bad thing is obviously the elephant in the room and the uh, rio tinto with the, yeah. with the other the other lithium project in western western serbia yeah. um 
So that situation turned into kind of a political football that uh, doesn't mean much for for uh, for Serbia's mining sector because, uh, pertinent to your first question, the government is a hundred percent supportive uh, to mining. Uh, our mining code uh, was built basically based on the on the Swedish model, and uh, you know permitting is straightforward. You get exploration exploration permits, drilling permits pretty fast. Um, Side note, the drilling is super cheap here. Um, and, uh, you know, anybody uh, anybody who comes to work here, uh, and I do have some experience with with, uh, with some juniors who, who uh, worked here or still do, yeah. um, don't have, don't have uh, anything bad to say about the jurisdiction. Um, and obviously, you know, the main, the main assets and the, the main uh, show uh, in our mining sector is Zijin uh, with the with the board district and the two operating mines there, and the third one being ramped up right now in Chukaru Peki. I'm sure that you know a good chunk of your listeners know about no. the Chukaru uh, discovery from the last decade. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bukashin, when uh, you, you said when your uh, investment path has begun, uh, mm -hmm. but in what commodities? What was your first investment? That's my question. Oh, my, my first stock I ever bought was, I, I don't, I think it was 2021, but because that was when I opened my first brokerage account. Okay. Um, and it was on trading two and two. And I think I bought uh, the, the Frankfurt airport. <laughs> and so it wasn't a mining stock. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the stock jumped about 70% on the news uh, uh, for, for the COVID vaccine, right? Yeah. So maybe actually, maybe it was late 2020. I can't remember now. But uh, so that was the first stock I ever bought, and I did well there uh, for a co you know a completely random reason. Uh, and back uh, back at that time, I still uh, I still hadn't picked up mining, right? Um, so uh, I you know I started started uh, really got interested in mining basically from early 2021. Um, <laughs> and so that was my first stock. I did well there, and you you could say like you know beginner stroke of luck like in gambling and. Uh, that's what uh, what kind of you know uh, got me to stuck to the business, so to say. That's great. Got me uh, to what... Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, your analyst work. Uh, are you in charge in specific commodity or sector, or you cover multiple commodities? Uh, how... You said how you, kind of... you you yeah. cover uh, more than one hundred uh, companies at the moment, right? Yeah, it, it's about two hundred names now, just for the newsletter. Uh, I do I do a lot of things on the on the side, so to say, right? Um, okay. And so, to take a step back, just a, a bit about our newsletter, right? We have okay. we have the free we have the free level, which is called the speculator speculator digest, where um, Lobo, our boss, uh, he <clears throat> just writes a weekly newsletter, basic uh, basically that is um, just focused on macro and the macro developments. Um, and before I even met Lobo, this is what I was was reading for, for had been reading for for quite a bit before before talking to him for the first time in person, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you know, I found it super useful back then, and I still do. And I, you know, whenever he posts that on the weekend, I never miss it. Um, it's not some arcane, profound, you know, uh, esoteric macro knowledge. It just common sense analysis of what's what's going on. Sometimes we get things right, sometimes mm -hmm. we get things wrong as as everybody does, right? Of course. Um, so that that's the that's the free part. The second the, let's say the first level of the subscription is called my take and uh, that is what uh, most of our team uh, uh, does. Uh, we maintain we basically maintain the database. Um, and the way it works is that clients uh, uh, clients ask for new companies to be added to the database on a monthly level, and mm -hmm. we have a voting system that determines what companies get added to the database every month. So that, that's an interesting part where clients can add companies. Um, and uh, you basically get every month, the entire database gets, gets a whole fresh update based on what, what, what has been happening and what has happened with, with uh, all the companies in the database. And, and it's just, say, um, helicopter view analysis with some some granular detail in some situations uh, of all of those companies that are that are in there, um, and the uh, highest level uh, of the of the service is uh, access to the portfolio that Lobo manages. Right, <laughs> so there are two levels, and uh, in my personal opinion, the second one, which is of course the more expensive one, is more of a personal preference. 
uh, uh, even though that, even though you know, I, I see all the reviews there, and we have overwhelmingly positive reviews, but I still don't want to say it's for everybody. Uh, on the other hand, the the first level and the database uh, is pretty much, I would say, a must-have for any for any uh, for any at least retail investor, right? We have yeah. some institutional clients as well who just use use our work to save their time. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, for any retail guy, like the database is really good, and uh, I'm not sure yet, but I think the price on that will be going up because we have we have a lot of companies there. So sorry for taking up like three or four minutes, but that, that's no, basically no, really. that's basically the, the the newsletter. So the the, the metals I am mostly focused on, uh, and this stems from my from my from my macro view on the commodity sector, uh, yeah. are are mostly copper and gold, uh, but I also do silver, nickel. Uh, and then, then the other stuff, right? Um, we can talk, you know, about each metal individually. But yeah, uh, the companies, uh, yeah, uh, the components I like, I like the most are usually in copper and gold. And for me, at least, unfortunately, mostly in copper. Um, okay, because, okay yeah. let's 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 start with the. Uh, I will ask you about ten commodities, and uh, you will say if you are bearish, neutral, mm -hmm. or bur or or bullish on them. In short to mid term horizon. Let's start. There will, with... there, there will probably be some that I have no opinion about, but okay. Then you, you yeah. can say new, new, neutral. Okay. Sure. Uh, let's start with copper. Bullish. Lithium. Tentative about it. Uh, can I? Do I just have to say yes, no, or can I justify? Uh, you can whatever you want. Um, so just just a couple of thoughts about lithium. Uh, I'm sure. not sold on the whole. Say brand new that lithium is the new iron ore thesis, uh, just because I see a lot of supply coming on, um, and uh, I'm not I'm not entirely sold on the um, let's say the EV revolution, right? So mm -hmm. tentative about it. Okay, uh, what about copper fundamentals? You can say more about that. Um, yeah, sure. Um, it, it, as I said, you know, it's my favorite metal. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I was first focused on the on the supply side there, and. The thing that makes me the most bullish, uh, with completely ignoring ignoring the demand side for a moment, is the project quality that is available in the market. And uh, you know this this can be put in in very simple terms that if you start going through the available copper, uh, you know, not built copper pro undeveloped copper projects on the market, yeah. you're going to realize that none of them can be built unless we have at least say five dollar copper. Uh, really... Not none of them, but uh, you know the vast majority. majority. Yeah. So, if I had to say it in one sentence, I would just say that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what about silver? Uh, silver, uh, I'm bullish only because of gold. Uh, uh, are you bullish more on silver or more on gold? Well, the general rule is that silver runs more in in bull markets, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes, because of the general rule, um, but. I am I am not entirely sure on the best way to play it. Of course, as a retail investor, you can you can um you can afford to focus on some really small names, obscure names, and yeah. so on and so forth. But if I was if I was um, uh, an institutional investor, I would be you know scratching my head really hard how to play it. Uh, maybe maybe the the spot the play on the spot price would be best. Yeah. Uh, next one, uranium. Um. Most of the money has been made. Uh, I was wildly bullish. Uh, now I don't care currently, and for the last couple of months, I don't care that much about it. But I still think there's upside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what about nickel? Nickel. Uh, I. I'm not actually. This is one thing that our newsletter got wildly correct. And uh, back when you know, in the say nickel was in a bubble maybe two years ago or so, and so we were warning that. The Indonesian supply would come on, and it would come on really hard. Mm -hmm. And we actually have—I I, believe—we have a free paper on the website that yeah, that you can find on our website on nickel. But uh, yeah, that was just a side note. So sorry for plugging the newsletter again. But uh, no uh, problem. Yeah, it's it was really cool to read that thing, uh, you know, uh, uh, recently and see see how correct it was. But um, <clears throat> I am uh, bullish on specific projects there. And uh, the reason why is because uh, nickel sulfide projects are extremely rare, and yeah. yeah. So if I if I could if I could get my hands on uh, earlier stage nickel sulfide project that you know threatens to be of extremely high quality, I would definitely be buying that, irrespective of the nickel price. 
but if I'm bullish on the metal or not, I would say no, uh, because it's being phased out of the battery technology. And again, I'm not entirely sold on the EV mm -hmm. revolution. But would you say that nickel is at the moment one of the most hated metals? Uh, nickel and PGMs, I would say. And PGMs. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah definitely. Um, I'm not seeing I'm not seeing much hate, even though you know the lithium price has gotten killed. I don't see much hate for it. That's just my say, you know, gut feeling. Um, okay. I don't, despite despite of the price action, I don't see that much that much hate for it because of the probably because of the belief in the in the in the EV uh, in the EV thesis. <clears throat> but yeah, I would say right now, nickel and PGMs. Uh, let's move to next commodity, graphite. If you know. I don't know much about it, but uh, the uh, I did I did read some material. The biggest project problem for the bulls there uh, is the artificial graphite that can be produced. So it's an opaque market. It's really tough to play. Uh, you have a problem if you want to invest in equity. You have to figure out like what kind of um, product they would be selling. If there would be a you know an off taker for that product because you definitely need to sign an off take agreement and so on and so forth, it's a different game than uh, than uh, you know wanting to invest in say copper and gold or or yeah. the say co conventional hard rock mining plays. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. What about oil? Bullish. Bullish. Yeah, uh... geopolitics. Geopolitics, and uh, I think that you know the the repercussions from the say the green craze and the green revolution are, are still you know haven't played out yet so you know at least flat to bullish okay uh final one bitcoin oh bullish bullish okay. not not wildly bullish but uh it's pretty much the same thesis as, as with gold um okay. and uh you know it's there's not much to say there i'm not bullish other crypto because i still have you know i have yet to hear a coherent thesis on some project that can convince me that it's actually changes something uh but but uh, bitcoin uh, bitcoin does make sense to me and uh, i can i can see it you know keep the growth up okay uh let's move to your portfolio how is actually your portfolio structure uh, what do you hold in your portfolio at the moment oh uh, i'm i'm mostly focused on the early stage names uh and i am mostly commodity agnostic uh as i said you know if I if I could find a high quality exploration stage uh, project for nickel sulfides, I would buy that irrespective of the nickel price. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's that. Uh, I try to focus on on uh, generating alpha instead of you know just waiting for the cycle to turn. Although of course I as with any investor retail guy, I would like to gold gold for gold to go like to five k right, but uh, that's not something that I include in my strategy. So uh, what I do is uh, focus on situations in individual names uh, that fundamentally change the situation for for you know for the better or for the worse, but uh, usually for the better because I don't really short stuff. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, that's what I do. Uh, I have effectively five or, or less positions, generally speaking, uh, and I don't have more than nine to ten stocks in my portfolio. Uh, so that's that's what I do. Okay, okay. Uh, you said uh, gold 5k. Is that maybe a circumstances where you would be terrified what what is going on in the world if we would really Definitely. see a five thousand uh, dollar uh, gold? <laughs> Personally, I would be horrified. Oh yeah, that. definitely, definitely. I'm not saying I'm, I'm wishing on it, uh, but it would definitely help all our say. You know, it would help the mining sector because. Uh, the liquidity that will start pouring into the sector would be would be immense, um, uh, would be of, of immense size. Uh, uh, I don't think it would be healthy for the sector, but that's another topic, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. But uh, Vukashin, what kind of investor are you? Long term, holding to your position, or do you mm. trade it from time to time? Oh, I'm a I'm a pretty loyal shareholder. Uh, I would say um, mm. I don't, I'm not much of a trader. I would say I I you know am, am even pretty bad at trading. Um, I did when I make say quote unquote uh, trade plays or short term plays. It's uh, usually as as was the case relatively recently of just uh, adding adding more cash into a winner. So mm -hmm. and perhaps if it runs out or runs up really really too much, uh, I sell some in the near term. So that would be kind of a 
you know a trading move but uh generally speaking i'm a, I'm a pretty loyal shareholder you know um and holding times i'd say at, le at least a year for, okay. for each position okay okay uh are you comfortable to talk some names from your portfolio and explain the rationale of holding some of those stocks oh yeah yeah of course uh most of my stuff is actually public not a hundred percent of it but uh you know based on my my uh twitter activity you can infer <laughs> what what i own and like um i also have some really positive commentary about things that i would never buy uh because they're just not not for my portfolio right <laughs> so sure why not yeah give us a few names uh, what is oh. your biggest position at the moment let's let's start oh. with that the biggest one uh has you know was and still is uh is uh, Awali resources uh, it's a name that you know has gotten pretty famous lately but uh i've been banging you know the table on it for like a year and some change so uh yeah it's uh, the biggest one is Awali uh, i still see you know a lot of fundamental upside there um uh, you know not to go too much in depth for, there on the project and whatnot but uh I'm comfortable saying now that if the central part of the project, actually of the of the joint venture asset, because there are other claims that are completely owned by the company, but if the central part of the joint venture asset with Newmont works out, we're probably going to be looking at a tier one tier one project. And I don't think that's, <clears throat> I don't think uh, that is uh, no you know nowhere near baked into the into the current uh, market cap. Yeah, and. Uh... You had a great success with Avali, and uh, yeah. you brought it. You brought that stock to my attention before, on which I thank you. Uh, and I believe that this path is definitely not not over. Uh, Bukashin, the second place in your portfolio, which, which stock is it? Which commodity? Second in the um, scale. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually <laughs> not sure. I I have I have stable resource and I have Regulus as well. Uh, I would have to check. I don't know which one is bigger, but um, yeah, the, the, those are the the uh, other two ones uh, that are say right now that are the, kind of the main ones uh, in, in uh, top three together with the Wally. Um, I've been holding Sable, uh, not in this size, but I've been you know the first time I bought Sable was <clears throat> I can't remember exactly, but maybe a year and a half ago or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the thesis there for me was that. Uh, the company was pretty heavily promoted in 21 and 22 it went up a lot uh, on for no good fundamental reason that time but uh, in the meanwhile the company has put itself in a lot of stronger position uh, in terms of the of the of the cash size and in terms of its project portfolio so we came into a situation with sable where the company has basically been trading at cash value for for a while uh, while at the same time having uh, a joint venture with South 32, where South 32 is paying for all the work in Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, they have other other uh, other copper copper porphyry targets in Argentina as well as of lately, and um, they have some royalties that they can sell for a couple of million. So mm -hmm. uh, we're we're not at negative enterprise value right now. Uh, although I don't you know enjoy uh, putting enterprise value numbers on on non cash flowing companies, but. Uh, uh, in this case, I was kind of comfortable with it because, again, you know, for for a bit we were trading at literally cash value, and if you add the whatever <clears throat> value that you slap on uh, on the royalties besides zero, we were at negative value. So whatever success that we might enjoy from the from the uh, exploration side of the business, which is of course the main part of the business, uh, it, it should get uh, rewarded pretty handsomely. Um, mm -hmm. And there's plenty of time if you think of. Uh, a junior explorer like an option that has a limited amount of time to deliver value for you right because the data is finite um until you have to dilute more uh yeah. the, the the data here in bro you know broadly speaking the data here is pretty big because there's a big cash pile uh uh, uh due to which the company doesn't have to raise money on the open market mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's what i like there and i like the ceo um okay. there are a couple of problems with it of course but uh every story has a flaw exactly uh, as as for regulus <clears throat> Uh, Regulus is a position that uh, I'm sure somebody who follows me uh, on Twitter, I, I posted uh, maybe an hour or two after I recently increased my position there, and that was about 90 cents. Um, 
a regular season special situation which has been sitting around for a while with a lot of loyal shareholders who thought that the asset they own would be monetized earlier uh but in in, in reality that hasn't materialized but <clears throat> what, what is happening right now we're getting to a period of time uh where uh, it will definitely be required for that asset to be materialized because the existing mine uh, near their uh, project <clears throat> is supposed to use uh, their asset as the, the feed material for the subsequent mine that's going to come on. So the existing mine there is processing oxides and the new operation is supposed to be a sulfide operation. Um, mm -hmm. And once you once you join those two, you get a really big, really big uh, copper project. Mm -hmm. And uh, why do I believe that this is going to be <clears throat> essentially monetized and a deal is going to be achieved is uh, because when you join those two projects together, actually you just join the land together, right? you get a top three or top five copper porphyry assets in the world. Um, and the general rule is that, you know, the best assets on the market find their way. Uh, and uh, this one, in my opinion, is going to find its way because of the quality and uh, because, uh, because of uh, the, the relative scarcity of those assets, as I said uh, in the beginning, in our, in our copper, copper thesis. Um, so if not top three, I would say it's definitely in the top five uh, copper projects worldwide held in junior hands in terms of quality. So mm -hmm. that's that's in a nutshell that would be that would be the reason to to own regulars. Yeah, uh, personally, I like uh, big porphyry deposits as well, but there are not too, there there is no too many those kind of deposits in the world. Uh, are you targeting any other uh, companies that have porphyries uh, porphyry deposits in the making or? Do you oh, have absolutely. Some on the radar, I mean. Oh yeah, absolutely. Radar. I mean, mo most of the <clears throat> most of my work, uh, you know, as th that's just the nature of the of the of the business and the geology. That if you look for big stuff, you're probably going to end up, you know, looking at porphyries, right? Uh, yeah. But I mean, both Sable and Awali I mentioned uh, have have porphyries on their on their projects. I mean, mo most of the actually the Sable's uh, Argentina part of the business is exclusively focused on on uh, finding copper porphyries. Um, yeah, I mean, those would be the immediate two that I, you know, already mentioned a minute ago, but uh, there, there's, you know, a, a bunch of other names that I do follow and uh, uh, I, I, you know, kind of suspect they might have success or not. I remember we had a common stock, uh, you and I, a few years yeah. ago, it was Brixton Metals, and they were yeah. searching. They are searching for they, big porphyry Yeah, they still, are. they still are. I never yeah. owned Brixton. I never owned Brixton, but I was. Uh, there was a period of time. I think that was when we were talking. I was really thinking hard about it. Yeah. Um, the problem with Brixton has been that uh, the the Thorn, actually the Camp Creek porphyry on the Thorn project, hasn't really worked out the way that everybody hoped it would. Yeah. <clears throat> but the more interesting part with Brixton now, if we are, you know. If we can just comment on the on the same the individual issuer, sure, uh, sure, a bit a bit more in depth. The more interesting part for me there is the joint venture with Ivan for Electric. BHP, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, of course the the BHP investment was there, but uh, the joint venture with uh, Robert Friedland's Ivan for Electric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean on yeah. Hawk Heaven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So that's something I'm watching watching pretty closely. Um, they so released far, the results uh, last week. Yeah. Yes, yes. And what, what they what they have there is basically the in, in porphyry theory, they have the, um, of course, the high sulfidation part of the system, but that system is usually peripheral to the to the center of of, yeah. uh, of the geology. And um, of course, it remains to be seen if they can find a center that is not not too deep uh, and it needs to and it, it needs to be at, at, a, at, a, at a high enough grade. Uh, so that is that is the in the situation there. But uh, uh, Ivan Co Electric is uh, Electric's involvement has me has me positive on the asset because of course they are paying for it, but yeah. they also they also have they also have you know one of the best one of the best exploration teams for this kind of stuff in the world. So yeah. th that's that's what I'm paying uh, attention to with with Brixton, um, and you know the, the share price has done what it's done. Um, yeah, you could say maybe deservedly slow so or not, but. Uh, there, there were signs. There were plenty of signs for anybody who was a, who was a shareholder earlier, uh, especially they had profits. There were plenty of signs to sell along the way. Yeah, agreed. Uh, 
it was a pass from nine yeah. cents to thirty five cents, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, that that was yeah. the spread. Yeah, uh, and, the, and sorry, the run was the run was I think on the BHP news, correct? On the BHP news, yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, Vukashi, do you have any other uh, companies on your radar that you can share with us? Oh, I have, I have, I have plenty, actually. Um, I mean, the ones that you don't have in your portfolio, the new entries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the new, I, I haven't done much buying lately. Uh, there was one sell I had, I had recently, uh, I booked a win there, um, maybe prematurely because the stock kept running, but um, it was also recent buy. Uh, it was Gold Source Mines with their project in in um, uh, uh, Guyana, yeah. And uh, they uh, they are getting acquired by by uh, Mako Mining, and uh, so yeah, uh, it, it's an all equity deal. Uh, I'm personally not interested in being a Mako shareholder. So once the stock jumped on the deal, uh, I sold, but it, it it kept climbing and it's about sixty four cents now. Um, so. Yeah, that was a recent win I was looking uh, looking at, uh, but what I was seeing there, and there are a couple of similar names I see I don't own. Um, mm -hmm. And when I say similar, uh, I'm thinking relatively small gold asset that makes sense, that works, that can be built, but it's not big enough for, for say, <laughs> you know, a major acquirer, right? And what what happened in the last two years? We had a we had a you know pretty rough market. And uh, those assets, even the ones that actually work, have been left for dead. So uh, another name that <clears throat> that uh, comes to mind in this category would perhaps I'm I'm not hundred percent sold yet, but uh, it it would uh, it would be Newcore Gold in Ghana. Um, mm -hmm. I don't I don't own it. I'm not buying it, so I'm uncomfortable saying that. Um, yeah, that would be another gold asset in that category that you know I I would I would bring up and say okay this might make sense uh and it's definitely a one that has been left for that and i like those okay uh what about uranium do you call any uranium stocks um yeah uh not 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 anymore not anymore i booked booked my wins there as i said uh most of the easy money has been made there okay. uh i'm personally not happy with how i executed the entire trade uh because back like say three years ago uh when i was supposed to be you know buying like crazy I was still wet behind the ears, uh, so uh, I you know, didn't do uh, as well as I should have. But uh, I booked a couple of doubles there, not a couple, several, um, and uh, I'm I'm not unhappy with it. But uh, yeah, uh, I've I've been a uranium bull, still am. But if you know, if a retail guy is looking for for big big returns in the next two years, uh, there are probably other places he can he can look into now for for say you know the the multi bag of returns. 10x or more <laughs> okay yeah, five uh, six yeah, ten. yeah uh you are you are known as a very good due diligence guy and you provided that also by removing one ceo of a copper company that is operating in ivory coast can you share us some details of that event what happened oh yeah uh you know by now i'm sure that a, a good chunk of people actually heard the story yes but, yes uh, but yeah please... no that was that was a wally right and <clears throat> It was a special situation because um, it was close to zero market cap, and the company was <clears throat> basically ran into the ground by the by the previous CEO. And uh, what essentially happened, they needed an investor to clean up uh, the clean up, you know, the the small amount of uh, of liabilities they had on the on the balance sheet, and they actually needed desperately needed a CEO change uh, uh, and the change for somebody who. First, would be able to run the company on the technical side properly and understand the asset that's uh, yeah. the underlying asset that's uh, under the joint venture deal with Newmont, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, of course, be able to raise money, which is something that the previous CEO was completely incapable of doing mm -hmm. uh, on both points. So, uh, essentially, what happened, not to make the the, the story too long, uh, okay. was you know. Uh, I, uh, I, not just me, but uh, a friend and I built a relationship with the with the uh, with the board uh, back then, and proposed that uh, because the, sorry, I'm going to take a step back here. When you when you try to uh, do shareholder activism, and uh, maybe maybe uh, maybe you know introduce some changes into a company, you have two ways. Way one is to agitate through the board of directors, which is yeah. the much more the much more elegant way 
yeah. uh, of doing things. And the other way is through the through the things we sometimes see uh, on the TSX venture where there are some disgruntled shareholders who do it publicly, right? Yeah. And the, the public way can get messy and it almost never works properly. Uh, so of course we opted <clears throat> we opted for the for the for the more uh, for the for the nicer way, which is through the board. So it required building a relationship with the board members and finding them an investor, uh, a strategic investor, a cornerstone investor who would take a big chunk of the company, take uh, extra board seats and ask for, uh, because they have the capital, the required capital, and uh, you know ask ask for the CEO to be replaced by the board. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, for for those who don't know, one of the jobs of the of the board of directors is to elect the CEO, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and and supervise the uh, executive members of the team, and you know to to um, advocate for shareholders' interests. So uh, <clears throat> essentially, what happened was we just asked them to do their job, uh, and uh, and uh, it worked. And you know we'll we'll see we'll see where the story uh, where the story ends up. But uh, you know the the exploration success on the ground has been, especially with the with the recent news, has been pretty spectacular. Yeah, agreed. Uh, after that happened, were you offered a board seat? Maybe. Oh uh, no, no. Uh, it's also it's also something that uh, just in case I of course said in advance, like I'm not even thinking about it because Im imagine having me on the board, right? That's <laughs> it's not not time for something like that yet. Okay, uh, let's continue on due diligence. Uh, Vukashin, what are the most important metrics for you when evaluating a junior stock? That, that's a very interesting question because everybody whom you ask, you're going to get a different opinion. Exactly. Uh, for me, for me, it, it is the underlying asset and what <clears throat> what we are dealing with. Um, and this this applies to uh, this applies irrespective of the stage uh, in, in in which the company is. Like you, it can be greenfield exploration, brownfield exploration. It can be an of existing course. resource and whatever stage of the development, or maybe if it's even in production. Um, the main question for me is the asset, uh, and, and if there is no asset, I'm probably not going to be interested, right? Uh, I know that some people uh, are going to say, "Hey, you people. know, the people is the most yeah. important part," but honestly, I don't want to be don't want to be too harsh. But a, a big chunk of those those guys who who look only at that are too lazy just to do their own work, um, and uh, so the the people part is extremely important as well, of course, uh, but. Uh, you know, one thing I was thinking about this pretty hard, but I, you know, I know a lot of people who don't want to say support uh, unknown names in the sector, uh, but it would be pretty, pretty, you know, <clears throat> hypocritical of me to say something like that because that's exactly what I am, right? I'm a nobody mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm a rookie, right? And why would I, if I, if I meet somebody and I can see that he, for example, I, I don't want to name this company because I'm still buying it. Sure. But there is there is a CEO uh, of a of a small small uh, small explorer who strikes me as a guy who knows what he's doing, right? Um, he is not a flashy name. He doesn't have uh, uh, much of a background, uh, but but he's a really really strong geologist, knows what he's doing, and he wants success. And so, if so, if I come with this idea to somebody and he tells me, "Oh, who's this guy? I don't want anything to do with him," I don't find that really nice. Uh, and for me personally, there's no reason to not support him because I'm a rookie as well, right? So that's what I think. Yeah. What data do you use when you're doing your due diligence? Are you reading the filings, corporate presentations? Are you going even deeper than that? Uh, it, it depends on the name. Uh, uh, what is interesting in the if you are talking about junior mining? Yes. The yeah the in the interesting part thing with junior mining is that you can discard the story just based on the presentation. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm at a point now where, uh, and I said this earlier in a podcast too, uh, where I can, I can look at a, at a corporate deck and I can figure out if somebody who made the deck actually cared about, about it. Right. So what I do when I look through the sector, <clears throat> I can, I can have a day where I download or have some of them sent to me, but I have like 20 decks downloaded and I just go through all of them. Mm -hmm. um you, you don't need more than 10 minutes to 15 minutes to to figure out if you are interested in hearing more about something so if you are <clears throat> that that's the way i do my own own usually uh, i open yahoo finance check the basic stuff open co.ca um and then i go for the duck so if i get interested then i go 
Then I go to CDAR, then I go through, say, three years worth of news releases, and uh, then I ask around about management and everything else that you can imagine. Very similar to my due diligence, very, very similar. Uh, but what are your top red flags uh, that keep you away from investing in one company? Bad assets. Uh, bad assets, of course. Uh, <clears throat> in a bil- of course, bad assets can mean a lot of things. Um, and sometimes you can, you can spot it from a mile away. Uh, and sometimes you need, for example, to open the latest technical report and see the, the say the skeletons, you know, in, in the uh, un, under the the rug. Uh, but uh, bad assets is number one. Um, number two is again we're coming back to people. Uh, if somebody had had failures in the past, that's not an, an instant no go for me, right? Mm-hmm. But if if I know that that failure was due to some reasons which were completely controllable, which were how how, how do I put it like not nice, right? Uh, yeah, they, yeah were, I got it. they weren't they weren't genuine genuine failures. Uh, then yeah. that is also that is a no for me. Um, another red flag is you can you can see when somebody is incapable of raising money. Uh, fourth red flag is you can sometimes play play interviews of some of some executives and you can pick up on how they handle things. So mm-hmm. that this is more more of a say uh, of an esoteric argument because it depends on your gut feel, right? Yeah. Uh, but th- I wouldn't say this is like a hundred percent a red flag, but it can give you a pretty good feeling if you have some experience under under your belt. Uh, but yeah, th- that would be the top three. Yeah, uh, you probably often uh, see uh, encounter lifestyle company CEOs in your research. I mean, are that is for me uh, one of the hated things uh, with companies when I see a lifestyle uh, CEO. Mm-hmm. D- do you have that similar view on that? I mean, the CEOs that are just here to fill their pockets, nothing else, uh, and. We uh, really have a of lot course of I do. Those. Yeah, of course I do. But uh, the funny part about the sector is that there are there are uh, companies which are obviously lifestyle companies, but you can still, the, I mean, they're lifestyle companies, but they're still legit companies uh, in whose stock you can still make a lot of money. Exactly. Uh, and yeah. and what I what I mean by this is uh, we uh, in, in the newsletter we call it the land bank place, for example. And the land bank plays are uh, non-economic assets that are usually quite big and that are sitting around in the market and doing nothing for a long time. And I know usually you. when the yeah when the cyclists turn and when the underlying commodity goes up, uh, those stocks go up too. So you know there is no actual business going on in, in those most of those companies, but uh, plenty of money can still be made on the stock. So of course I dislike it, but there is a use even for those names, you know. So it's a it's a kind of a nuanced argument. Uh, but yeah. the, the worst the worst lifestyle the the worst lifestyle uh, situations that you can think of are the issuers that uh, change their focus and change their name based on the commodity price swings. So mm-hmm. for example, two years ago uh, when 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 lithium when it was two years ago roughly. Uh, yeah. When lithium started surging, you had a bunch of gold companies, you know, uh, all of a Which sudden becoming lithium explorers. Then recently you have more and more gold companies going into uranium. Now you're going to have more and more gold companies all of a sudden because gold is going up and so on and so forth. So that is something I really hate. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't even need don't even need to check who, who is in the board, who is in management. Uh, sometimes if if uh, I paid some attention to that company and I find it really egregious. I just take all the names from the board and have a list. Um, mm-hmm. So not, not, not board necessarily, but at least management. I just take all the names from management and just I have a list for, for those people. So mm-hmm. uh, I kind of keep, a, keep, a, keep, a, keep track of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. How important is uh, skin in the game for you? Um, it is important. Uh, but one thing that I found to be much less important based on a practical example I had of a company I got completely wrong, um, and I, I talked about this name recently too, was Valor Metals. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I lost no money in it, by, by the way. We, you know, Nothing worked out, but I lost no money there because of the uranium acid they sold. And um, so 
that was my thesis from the beginning. Like, if everything goes wrong, at least I won't lose money because they have the uranium asset that's going to be monetized. Um, and even that monetization was was horrific, but that's a different topic. Uh, yeah. Regarding skin in the game, the funny part with Valor was that the, the CEO of Valor um, has been, yeah, I can say has been because he's still kind of buying the stock. Um, and, and which I have no idea, you know, why and what's going on there. But uh, insider buying is not something that particularly excites me anymore. Um, and if you are going to care about insider buying, it might serve you best if you compared it to their total compensation on a yearly level. So if somebody is collecting, say, a 400k uh, paycheck and they are buying 50 to 20,000 or 50, maybe even 50k on the market, um, it's not, doesn't really mean that much, you know, that's just mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, so I don't pay that much attention to insider buying. Uh, but uh, skin in the game is important if you are looking at newly created companies. Uh, and this can get kind of tricky for some retail investor who, do, who don't go that much in depth, but newly created companies tend to have uh, a lot of cheap paper issued to, to, find, uh, to founders and, and say the earlier stage investors. So you can get yourself into situations where say a company uh, is coming public with a hundred million shares, uh, and they had uh, maybe 60 million shares that were acquired at 15 cents or less. And mm -hmm. uh, you, you can have the, the, the stock price being at a dollar and say of those 60 million that were acquired cheaply, you can have at least half of them held in hands that don't have to report when they sell, right? And of course, those shares, those, those shares are sometimes escrowed, but mm -hmm. those escrow accounts get unlocked with time. So you have constant selling pressure for people who don't care. They're just, yeah. you know, they they are literally just uh, cashing in their their multi x gains, um, because they were there, uh, they they were there early. So um, that's the type of skin in the game that I think should be paid the most attention to. Mm -hmm. um, but as for for you know the most conventional idea about it, like inside insider buying equals always good. I disagree. It is, no. You know, at the at the at the very best, uh, at the very best, it's a good sign. Uh, but I mostly take it right now. I take it as okay. That's nice, but it's I'm still neutral about it. Uh, what about uh, let's say GNA num some GNA numbers? Mm -hmm. uh, junior stock, five million dollar market cap, yeah. and they are spending like for office. Uh, I don't know, big amount of money on office and marketing. Are you following those metrics as well? Maybe a cash burn, etc. Absolutely, of course I do. But uh, I don't get to those things uh, if I don't care about the asset. You know, of course. back to my initial point, if like the asset doesn't make sense, I don't really care about the GNA. Uh, but of course I do. And uh, th those are some things that are pretty, pretty obvious to figure out. Uh, yeah, of course, th th there there are some, some shenanigans where... Um, you can find that the the marketing budget, for example, is not really under marketing in the in the financial financial yeah. paper. Right? Yeah. Um, so you, you can have uh, th those kinds of those kinds of things, but uh, you still see that there is a bunch of money going somewhere and it's not in the ground. Um, there are rules that people use, like you can have a ratio that, for example, if you raise money, not more than thirty percent of it should go to GNA office travel, whatever. Uh, that makes sense, but uh, I tend to focus on the absolute numbers, right? And, okay. you know, you can look at the, usually you just look at the information circular and you can see the management compensations on the on the yearly level and so on and so forth. Agreed. Uh, Vukashin, can you name 10, five or 10 company CEOs or mining people or market experts that you have the most respect for? Oh, uh, I can, but should I do people or institutions? No, no, I meant people. People. Yeah. Oh, uh, we have to start with recruit, right? Uh, sure. I don't care about the cynical comments. I'm a recruit groupie, and that that that's it. Um, recruit. Um, Number one. Definitely. Um, the Landin group. Yeah. Number two. Um, All the family. I agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, three would be. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, this is an institution too, but the people there would be Pathway Capital. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, 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 I assume that uh, some retail guys who 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 will be watching this don't uh, are not really familiar with them, but they are basically the team behind Equinox Gold, Sandstorm Gold, um, 
and some of those successes, right? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't want to mention some earlier stage names that are kind of uh, currently active. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, so that would be number three. Uh, yeah. Number four, number four would be uh, again an institution. But uh, I met two guys from there who are absolutely phenomenal guys. Uh, would be La Mancha, uh, and uh, number five. Uh, oh, uh, Justin Tolman from Sprat. And this is so. Yeah, I, I mean, five is too is not not enough. Five spots is not enough. But uh, I want to 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 put a a person on, on number five. That would be Justin Tolman from Sprat. Okay. Okay. Uh, what about uh, let's say again top maybe top ten follows on Twitter the people that you respect on the, from oh, Twitter space. I I'm not sure if I'll be able to get to ten, man. Okay. Give me five. Yeah. Uh, are we talking just mining or in general? No, in, it can be in general. Yeah. So, in terms of mining, uh, unfortunately, he's a guy who's not that active. Uh, so I won't bring him up. He's a he's a geologist too, but uh, yeah, he, he, he's not really that active, so it's not a follow. Um, no. um, <laughs> well, let's start from macro, right? Okay. Uh, and in terms of macro, I would bring, definitely bring up the uh, Joseph Wang, the fat guy. Mm, again, don't care about some of the cynical comments. Uh, sure. He's one of the best, especially since <laughs> since uh, since COVID. He's like one of the macro, macro guys who absolutely nailed almost every move. Um, he would be on the macro side, um, despite some of the maybe bombastic commentary that he has sometimes. Uh, I would also put uh, Luke Groman in the in the macro uh, basket. Uh, I would also put Whitney Baker in the macro basket. Uh, okay. Some yeah, some some of the stuff that she writes and some gets into some arguments on Twitter uh, from time to time goes over my head because I'm not a macro guy, but I do can grasp most of the things. But she has been absolutely spectacular too. So that would be three names. Um, yeah. In terms of what about terms Lynn Alden? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, that Lynn too. Absolutely. Um, but she's not. She doesn't really put that much stuff on Twitter, right? Uh, it's mostly just memes on Twitter right now. But uh, yeah. absolutely subscribe to Lynn Album. Uh, one hundred percent. Um, Lynn too. That that would be four, right? Yeah, so, another one. Yeah, and another one would be we have to take uh we have to take a mining person. Um, let's say. Oh, let's say the koala. Yeah, in terms okay. of mining. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's five. Uh, okay, time to wrap it up. Uh, that was Vukashin Pekovic. Uh, Vukashin, once again, thanks for coming. It was a great chat. It was a great chat, and uh, I look forward to hosting you again. Oh, definitely. Thank you a lot for having me.